Okay, welcome back to everybody that's here and then to those who are going to be joining us by video and then maybe others who will jump on here um, in a minute. I will let them on as we see that. So every now and then you may see me kind of staring at the screen a little bit, but um, for the all of you that are on here have been with us before, so you kind of know the format. We will, I do encourage you to participate and I will try to ask some questions, but even if I'm not necessarily asking a question, feel free to speak up. And you can mute yourself if you feel like you've got a lot of background noise, but there's few of us, so we can probably keep ourselves unmuted and um, be able to participate a little better. But there's also a little bit of disconnect with like the Zoom format where um, we're not in the same room, you know, and, and sometimes I don't always hear um, directly, uh, immediately or whatever. There might be a little bit of a, a lag, but Anyway, we will we will go forward, but let me get started with prayer and then we're going to jump in. Gracious, kind and loving Heavenly Father, we praise you. Thank you for who you are, for the re revelations that we have through your word and your spirit within us to make the connections and help us and guide us and educate us. Um, we ask that you be with us today as we handle some amazing chapters, um, big, big subjects. And we want to, I want to handle those accurately, carefully, not adding or taking away at all, um, but that we don't leave here unchanged, that we don't leave here with just um, check mark off of an accomplishment or a lesson done, or even just let's move on that, but that these chapters impact us and that at, by impacting us, they change us from within and that that comes outward as we interact with other people as we deal with our lives, as we prepare ourselves for what is coming, whatever that is. Um, there are so many parallels to what's being talked about here and what we're facing or what we may be facing. So we just ask that you prepare us, Father. Um, be with us, God, us in this discussion and in them watching the tape with Kay. And for those who can't be with us in person right now, we ask that they get out of this what you would have them and that we would all be encouraged to continue in our studies and show ourselves diligent to serve um, in, in study and in, in showing up and producing whatever it is uh, you know, for your glory in the work that you have for us. So we just ask for that and thank you for it in advance in Jesus' name and for his sake as well. Amen. Okay, got somebody else. Okay, so um, as we get started, let's do a little bit of review of Isaiah 1, uh, part 1, not Isaiah, not just the ch first chapter, but um, there's no way we can handle it completely and um, um but we want to just kind of do a real quick overview to get us where we are. Okay. How many chapters are in the book of Isaiah? Five. Okay. Somebody said something, but I didn't hear it. I think 65 was it? 66. Six. 66. Um, and sometimes I think of that twice the number of man, because um, man, man's number is all short of God's perfection, which is seven. Um, okay, so number one, there's 66 chapters. How many books in the Bible? 66. There you go. 66. Okay. How many books are in the Old Testament? How many letters in the word L old? How many letters are in the word testament? <laughs> nine. Okay, so that's one way to remember it. There's three letters in the word old. There's nine letters in the word testament. So there's 39 books in the Old Testament. Okay, there's three letters in the word new, and there's nine letters in the word testament. When you multiply three by nine, what do you get? 27. Mm -hmm. It's a way to remember how many books are in the Old Testament versus the New Testament. So as we study the book of Isaiah, interestingly enough, the segment division 
between one part of the first part of Isaiah that we've already that we've studied some of us have studied together is there's 39 chapters and then there's 27 chapters so this part part two we're studying that last 27 chapters so sometimes I just like those little things that help us remember um, I don't know why Isaiah was written this way but I find it fascinating because there's a lot of debate and controversy over who will acquire the books in the Bible there. There are some really good reasons, but not everybody agrees with those reasons. So um, as we looked at the first part, the first 39 chapters, the overall part of the first part was about God's character and judgment. And we saw that through those 39 chapters. Then when you break it down into smaller portions, then you've got the first 12 chapters were discourses concerning Jerusalem. And then from 13 to 23, you had the oracles, the oracles of other nations, including our oracles of judgment against those nations, including Moab and uh, Cush, Ethiopia, Damascus, the wilderness of the sea, Edom, Arabah. There's more, but that was the oracles. And then starting in 24 through 27, you've got the discourses regarding that day. Okay, so I'm putting that day in quotations because it was a phrase that day. There were discourses regarding those, um, including the destruction of the earth and the Lord reigning on Mount Zion. And then um, in chapters 28 through 33, you had the woes, like those chapters began or included uh, sections about the woes, like woes, the, the coming of the king and the kingdom. Um, and then in 34 and 35, you've got God's ransom. So that was the theme of those two. And then we have from 36 to 39, just this historic interlude. Uh, and we'll discuss that a little bit, but those were, those are just a very broad and fast review of part one of Isaiah. So part one being about judgment, God's character showing up also, but God's judgment, this last portion starts in a way that helps us understand that there's now more hope. Now, throughout those chapters, I've always, I've pointed out whenever God has prophecy, he also always infuses hope in his prophecy. He doesn't leave them without hope. Okay, now let's just get a little bit of historic context. Chapter one, verse one, tells us when this is written, you know, and, and just like the, a lot of the questions are answered, who, what, when, where, and why are answered in the first chapter, including who is writing this book. Pretty simple. I don't usually ask hard questions. <laughs> who is who is this vision being given to? Isaiah. Isaiah, right. He's the son of Amos. Um, what is it concerning, or who is it concerning? People of Israel. Judah and Jerusalem specifically named, but yes, we would call them also the people of Israel. Um, and during whose reigns, who is reigning during the time so that we can literally put it in history? Hezekiah. Hezekiah is the last one, yes. Going back to Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. The, the majority of the book seems to be written during Hezekiah's reign, but those other kings were reigning, and we see places in chapters that give us a statement of in the last year or in the year of some, you know, such and such kings, Uzziah's death, for instance. So we know that the prior part, if it's all written chronologically, was written, I mean, not chronologically, sorry, the events aren't chronological, but if it was written chronologically in Isaiah's time, if those chapters were, then the end of a king's life, everything prior to that would have been during his life. Jotham is really not mentioned much as far as like his death, but he would have died prior to Ahaz reigning and obviously Hezekiah reigning. Um, the historic interlude of 36 to 39 is real time events in Isaiah's real time. You know, so it's um, the story of 
the Babylonians coming, Babylonians, sorry, coming and visiting Hezekiah when after Hezekiah had had that almost death experience, and and then he just shows them everything. And Isaiah's response to him, which you looked up this week in your in your study, what was Isaiah's response when he walked in? Basically, said, "What did you just do?" What did, he, what did Isaiah tell Hezekiah? This is the very end of 39. What did Isaiah tell Hezekiah was going to happen? Not necessarily because of what he did, but somewhat because of what he did. What What's going to happen? The conqueror. He tells of that conquering and that yeah. captivity, right, that's coming. Um, and so... We always have to remember when we're studying a book, especially prophecy, we've got to remember when a, something is written by the, in this case, Isaiah, when it is written, we have to stop and say, is he writing about his time? Like in Isaiah's day, that's happening or going to happen, or is he writing about something that's coming after when Isaiah is living and writing? And is it before our time? Or is it coming, is it future to Isaiah and future to us? It's not always 100% easy to figure that out, but sometimes it is. So in this case of Isaiah 39, when um, Hezekiah, when Isaiah goes in to talk to Hezekiah, because he's shown everything to this Babylonian group that came, he says, all of your 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 offspring are going to be captured and everything that you've shown them everything in your house everything that your father stored are going to be taken okay we haven't seen that necessarily in the book of isaiah yet but sometimes when we read that we fail to remember we know about this like we know this is going to happen during Isaiah's writings, when you looked up the timeline that they give you at the very back in your appendix of, of those king's years between Uzziah and Hezekiah, um, there's a major event that happens, and a captivity event that happens during Isaiah's writings. And what captivity event am I talking about? Is, is it the Babylonian captivity? Does that happen during Isaiah's lifetime or is it a different event? It's the Northern Kingdom. The Northern Kingdom is taken a captive by the Assyrians, um, which Isaiah talks about. He had told them that this was happening. Um, there are several places. Um, now, Isaiah is speaking to the Southern Kingdom, but it's not that he's never speaking to or about the Northern Kingdom. If we remember, the Northern Kingdom is made up of 10 tribes. The Southern Kingdom is only made up of two tribes, and that's Judah and Benjamin. It's easier to remember that, and then I just say the rest. <laughs> the Northern Kingdom is all the rest. Um, but the Assyrians had come in and taken the Northern Kingdom captive. They took, God brought this about because of what main thing was going on all those years in the Northern Kingdom. Could, could God have stopped it? Is this just a nation that's just too strong? You know, what was the cause? What was the reason? You don't know? I mean, do you not know why the Northern Kingdom was taken captive? From the beginning of the Northern Kingdom, they went into idolatry. They never not went into idolatry. As a matter of fact, the first king who was Jeroboam created those golden calves for them to, or those uh, places of worship, three different places of worship. One was at Bethel for them to go to because he feared they would go back to Jerusalem to the temple and their hearts would return to God and to that 
you know, they would, he would lose them. So in order to give them something, he gave them these places of worship. And they never, there was never a good king in the Northern Kingdom. And there was a, a, a king that, that followed after God. There was never one of those. And they, they always worshiped others. Now, were there people in the Northern Kingdom that may have stayed true to faith? Yes, there, there could have been that. Some even made their way back to the Southern Kingdom. Um, but by and large, as a whole, the Northern Kingdom never returned to God. Um, and they were taken captive by the Assyrians. This was about a hundred years prior to the Babylonian captivity. It was during Isaiah's time. If you look at that timeline, you can see it. Um, it's during Isaiah's time and it would have been in 733 to 722 BC. Isaiah is 739 to 681 BC. Um, the if you go over to the next page and you see the Babylonian captivity begins in 605 BC, which is about 75 years after Isaiah. So what we're talking about in, in Isaiah 39 is going to happen, but it's not going to happen in Hezekiah's lifetime, which was kind of his relief at the end. Like, oh, good. It's not going to happen during my lifetime. I think I would have had a little bit stronger reaction than that. Um, and I, I would have definitely tried to be preparing my children for what was coming. Okay, so then as we start in Isaiah 40, we're going to look at this as we tend to do, um, chap, uh, sorry, paragraph by paragraph. So we just take it in little chunks and see. But we also want to see what does the whole chapter talk about? What are the first words? Because it, it kind of sets the tone for the shift. What are the first words? Comfort. Comfort. Oh, comfort, my people, says your God. And then he says, speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended. That her iniquity has been removed. So these are things that God is saying. Her warfare has ended. Her iniquity has been removed. And this is the iniquity or the warfare that she received of the Lord's hand double for her sins. So the reason for the warfare and um, and what they have been going through is from the Lord's hand and it's as a cause of her sin and her iniquity. Okay. Again, we're going to look at this and, but we need to always be thinking when this stuff is talking, I mean, it's when in Isaiah's life that this is written is one thing, but when is he talking about? Is he talking about right then? Like, in other words, um, after chapter 39, in the next moment during Hezekiah's life, is there going to be this comfort? Is that warfare going to have ended? Have they been, have they received from the Lord's hand double for their sin? So we have to try to establish that, that, um, to understand the when. And then in verses three to eight, it's talking, this is one of those things that she, Kay had us marking is a voice calling or someone speaking or someone calling out and, and, and noticing that and who is speaking to whom. Um, so here in verse three, we see a voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness, make smooth in the desert, a highway for our God. Have you ever heard that before? I'm sorry. Now you said something. I just didn't hear it. Revelation. Um, well, possibly in Revelation, but we looked it up this week as well. This is where well, we looked it up in Malachi, for instance. Who is this one that's clearing the path or making smooth the highway for the Lord? Who did it turn out to be? Jesus. Well, Jesus is, is the one that is coming, but who cleared the pathway for him? John the Baptist. John the Baptist, right. So you have, um, we have that in, talked about in Malachi, still a prophecy, but in every gospel, I'm sorry, what were you going to say? I said every gospel. Yes. In every gospel, we looked it up, every gospel, it's talking about it. And if we weren't sure, like, in other words, is it really talking about John? When John is asked, are you the one, meaning are you the Messiah? He said, no. 
are you Elijah? He said, no. He said, I am. And he quotes this verse. He says it in you know his way, but he says, I'm the one that's crying out, you know, coming out from the wilderness. And where was John? He was in the wilderness eating locusts and honey. I mean, sorry, locusts and yeah, I think it is locusts and honey. We think locusts might be carob, by the way, instead of actual locusts, but who knows? <laughs> I, I would rather think of it as carob. But um, but he was making smooth the way for the Lord. What was John's primary message? What was the word he used? Repent. All the time? Repent. Okay. So the pathway made smooth was repentance. Repentance is necessary and not, not that we are doing something in the sense of like, we're going to bring it about, but we have to repent on that pathway to salvation. So John's message clearly was repentance. And he was called John the Baptist because he also baptized, but he, his baptism was, baptism was a baptism of repentance. And who else did he baptize? Jesus. Jesus. Yes. He baptized Jesus. And he was the one that when Jesus was walking down, Number one, he said, I'm not worthy to tie your shoelaces. Um, so there's that relationship. Also, just as a reminder, what's the earthly human relationship between John the Baptist and Jesus? We're cousins. They're cousins, right. Mary and Martha were cousins. So John and, and Jesus were cousins. And by the way, John leapt in his mother's womb when Mary came pregnant, carrying Jesus. So in essence, John, even in the womb, announced who Jesus was, which is really incredible. And then also it came from Martha and Mary, but in their, in the, what the statements they made. So Jesus is, this is who it's talking about. And that's what Kay was telling you, right? Jesus there, because it's talking about Jesus coming, but the one that cleared the way was John the Baptist. And, and then in Malachi 4, you also see Elijah mentioned. And Elijah's coming before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So was that Jesus's first coming? Or is the great and terrible day of the Lord before Jesus's second coming? Just something to think about. Because sometimes we put those ideas together and think that Elijah's already come. And the great and terrible day of the Lord, is it, has it already happened or is it still future to us? So be thinking about that. So then in verse four, it just talks about what kind of leveling. And it says, let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low and let the rough ground be made plain, a plain and the rugged terrain, a broad valley. This is literally a leveling. Okay, when it's talking about making a path straight or smooth a desert highway for our God, that's it's a leveling. Now, did that physically happen around the region when Jesus came the first time? No. So here's another example of when you're dealing with prophecy, you might have a more near fulfillment and then a further fulfillment later on. Okay, so is John the Baptist Elijah? Jesus even said when asked, He's already come, like kind of referring to John. So is John the Baptist Elijah? I'll say kind of yes and no. I mean, that's my understanding. Um, you have to just kind of keep thinking about this. I just believe more so it's not fully completed yet. Everything hasn't been completed completely. And then it says, then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice calls, says, call out. And then he answered, what shall I call out? It says all flesh is grass and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. So here it's giving us something that we can look at and see. We know about grass. We know about flowers. We know that they fade, whether they fade from drought or they fade from the seasons changing and winter coming or whatever. We've experienced that. That's something that we understand. But then it's saying all people are grass. So it's saying like this that you understand if God's breath breathes on you, that you that people will fade as well. Then it says in contrast, but the word of our God stands forever. So you've got a contrast between fading and standing forever. 
So it's good to mark that. Then in verses 9 to 11, what's it talking about here? Who are the two named bearers of good news? Jerusalem and Zion. Zion and Jerusalem. Sometimes those are interchangeable terms. Sometimes it's a, you know, a little more specific about a portion of Jerusalem. But either way, it's saying they are the bearer of good news. And they're to say to the cities of Judah, number one, they're also supposed to lift it up and not fear and say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and he will reckon, sorry, and his recompense is before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. So who is it talking about here? Jesus. Jesus, right. Jesus is coming. Um, his reward is with him. We cross-reference this to, to Revelation 22, where Jesus says, behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to render to every man according to his deeds. Okay. That's what Jesus says in Revelation 22 um, to something that still has not yet happened for us, has never happened yet. Uh, he, his second return, his second coming. But here, Notice it says the Lord God will come. So if you ever wondered if Jesus is God, here is a reference to call him Yahweh um, Adonai. I think it's Yahweh Adonai or Elohim. Yahweh Elohim or Yahweh Adonai. Um, so yeah, the capital L-O-R-D. Oh no, that's little. So it's Adonai, Adonai Yahweh um, will come with his might. So and when it says his reward is with him, his recompense is before him, that is the good and the bad, in a sense, of that you're going to be rendered according to your deeds. And then he's going to shepherd them like a flock. And we know that Jesus is the good shepherd. And then in verses 12 through 17, what is being talked about here? Jesus, the Holy Spirit. God okay. Jesus, and just who God is. Yeah, who God is. Um, and in a way of uh, comparison, the nations in comparison to God, right? So when it's talking about who has measured the waters, these questions are asked with kind of a um, understood response. Like it's not really a who, I have no idea, you know, but it's like, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has informed him? These It reminds me of questions that God asked Job. Like, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth, right? And then it says, with whom did he consult? And who gave him understanding? And who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge? The answer to all these is no one. I mean, it was always God, right? And um, informed him in, of the way of understanding. Behold, and here's the contrast, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of the dust on the scales. Notice he was the one that was weighing the scales, right? He was the one that counted the dust and weighed it but they're just a speck in the dust. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beast enough for burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They were regarded by, less, by him as less than nothing and meaningless. So the big comparison here is between who is God and by comparison, who are the nations? And, and how helpful is this for us? I mean, I love my nation. I want it to remain strong. I don't like what I see happening or where I think we're headed. I don't want to live anywhere else in the world. But we have a tendency to think of these nations being so 
strong. Like we feared Russia forever and ever, or the USSR, and now again, Russia, or Putin. And we hear about China, you know, getting stronger and stronger. But who is our God? <laughs> who is our God? And if we keep that in mind, we don't get to direct him and guide him and pray to him and he's going to do my bidding. But I can count on knowing that these, these big entities and powers, whether it's like a whole nation or just whatever power is, is affecting your life right now, you know, at a, a smaller scale, whether it's a job or local government or state government or whatever else, they're like a speck in all of the dust that God has weighed and measured that by the way, he created. I mean, and, you know, kind of the old joke, I could, I brought you into existence and I can take you out. And, and that's, that's God. He can do that. So keep that in mind. And how does this fit into what we've already seen? You know, there's all the judgment of the nation of Israel, the Northern kingdom and the Southern kingdom. Interesting time to freeze huh? <laughs> that we've seen. Um, um, all the I name- lost you for a moment. Okay, sorry. I, I heard like something. I heard something. No, I heard- um, <laughs> anyway, all the in in the first thirty nine chapters, the first part, we saw judgment and we saw the character of God. We saw the judgment against specific nations, but we also saw, which we didn't really talk about that much, what was the status and state of the people that Isaiah was talking to? You know, basically, God was just frustrated. With he didn't want their sacrifices anymore. He didn't want their play acting. He didn't want their performances. He wanted them truly. And he would even say, you know, do the deeds, do the things that you should do. You know what they are. Um, and then they get to sit and watch as the Northern Kingdom goes into captivity. And I was trying to get myself to understand the proximity thing and some of us live in the southern part of the eastern part east part of Tennessee and so if we just took a few counties and that be the southern kingdom and then the rest of east Tennessee is the northern kingdom do you think that we would feel the impact if that group of people that close to us was taken into captivity yeah we would know it even back in the day of less less ability to have communication like we have today, instant communication, we would know about it and we would be concerned that it could happen to us as well. Or we'd be arrogant thinking, oh, it happened to them on, you know, for, for good reason. And it didn't happen to us. And we remain arrogant till a hundred years later when it happens to us as well. So we would notice it would impact us. And, and God is trying to show us, you know, come back but return to true worship. No, not just the practices, not the offerings that that were meaningless and just, you know, checking off the box. Um, but now he's saying there's something coming. He's, he's talked about it in 39, but there's something coming that is going to be this the received from God's hand and a warfare against you. But there's comfort because there's an end to it. And I will, I will uphold you and I will bring you back. And Jesus is coming, not his name, but there is one coming. And there's somebody that's going to come and make that path smooth in advance, pay attention, and then tell you I have the good news. I mean, what this good news would be is the same good news as we call it, the gospels, the good news. That good news is Jesus. You know, Jesus, God himself is coming. And with him, is rule and with him is might and with him is his reward pay attention and then don't be so arrogant as to think that either the nations coming against you are to be feared because you have god or that you are so great because in god's mind you're a speck you're just the whole nation is a speck um can't be compared And then it says in verses 18 to 20, we get this theme kind of continuing in 18 to 20. What is, what is it talking about there? There's another comparison. 
So first it's God to the nations. Now it's God to what? Their idols. Their idols, right? Can you compare? I mean, there, he's asking this question. Who can you liken to God or what? Um, what likeness can compare to him? They're creating, they're making these craftsmen, these goldsmiths, these silversmiths are, are making these images, these idols, and they're acting like that is in some comparison to God. Verses 21 to 26. This is a, along the same lines. There's a comparison. There's a question. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understand from the foundation of the world, world, sorry, of the earth? It is he who sits above the vault of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. It is he who redu reduces rulers to nothing and who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. Scarcely have, have they been planted, have they sown, um, has their stock taken root in the earth, but he merely blows on them and they wither. Remember it said before, God's breath, you know, withers, right? He just blows on them and they wither and the storm carries them away like stubble. To whom? then will you liken me? What's the answer to that question? No one, right? No one, nothing, whether it's nations, big, big entities, whether it's an idol that you've set up or anything, nothing can be compared to God. So over and over and over through these paragraphs, you see that nothing can, can be compared to God. No one is equal to God. And then it says, um, to whom then will you liken me that I should be his equal? The answer is, there's no one. Says the Holy One, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars. The one who leads forth their host by number and calls them by name. Because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. Okay. Whether we're really talking about the twinkling lights in our skies or whether he's referring to angels, because sometimes angels are likened to stars, doesn't really matter. Either way, God has named them. God leads them forth. God stretched out the heavens like a tent oh, and he rules over the vault or the circle of the earth. Um, and none of them are missing that he is going to care for that he's going to keep nothing can be taken out of his hands no one can equal him no idol over and over just hammer that home <laughs> hammer it home in your head starts with comfort tells of the coming of the lord and the good news of that and then just says remember nothing compares with god nothing nobody nothing and then in verses 27 to 31 We've always got to remember, sometimes we get to very familiar passages and with, while they're great and it's great that they're familiar, we got to put them back in to the context, right? 27 to 31 says, why do you say, oh, Jacob and assert, oh, Israel? Okay, so who are Jacob and Israel? Because sometimes we, I personally think of Israel as a nation and only a nation or even a geographic place like it's got borders and we call it Israel but who was Israel to start with it was a person right it was a man his original name is Jacob God changed his name to Israel the L part is God infusing his name into Jacob's new name so it's Israel um the L part and it says, my, they are saying, or they're asserting my way is hidden from the Lord and the justice do me escapes the notice of my God. Are they right? They are not right. They're absolutely not. Remember this God that nobody can compare to that. No nation that they're just a speck in his eye or his notice. Um, it says, do you not know? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. Okay, so here we've got this group saying, my ways are hidden and the justice is not, that, that is my due, is not going to come to me because I'm getting by with everything. I'm getting by with it. And God reminds, you can't even understand my understanding. It's inscrutable to you. 
God, he gives strength to the weary and to him who lacks might his, he might, he might increase his power. Sorry. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Sorry. I had to say it right. Though youths grow weary and tired, which it shouldn't be. I mean, we look at kids running around all the time, or then we start seeing them acting like they're just tired all the time. How many times have you said to them, there's no way you can be tired. You're too young to be tired. Right. <laughs> um, Youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous, vigorous young men stumble badly. Yet, those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They'll mount on up with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow tired, and they will walk and not grow weary. So it comes down to, is it really about might? Is it about my ability or our collective ability or a nation's ability? comes down to who truly is going to have strength and mount the ability to mount up above things and run and not get tired and walk and not grow weary are those who wait on the Lord. And you looked up this word wait this week to see what it meant. Um, what did you find? <coughs> I'm sorry, say it again. Oh, no, I'm sorry something else never mind <coughs> now it was glory that we looked up maybe we didn't wait look up wait i think she told us but what wait, yeah she says on page nine wait or quava in hebrew means to look for hope or expect to wait or look eagerly for um so think of this in terms of waiting like you're anticipating christmas morning you know, with, or someone coming to visit, you're oh, anticipating that with, with maybe some work involved, you know, so waiting isn't sitting and twiddling your thumbs. Waiting means actively working at the things that God would want you to be doing, that you're very well known and versed in knowing what you're supposed to be doing, yet you're not getting ahead of him. You know, you're not handing um, Abraham your handmaiden and say, and produce a child through her. Um, you know, some of the things that we know in scripture where some of the patriarchs went ahead of, of the plan. You've even got Jacob and Esau. We just talked about Israel, J Jacob. Jacob's mom was told when the babies were in the womb that the second would rule over the first. And yet she and Jacob couldn't wait. And they did trickery to get things the way they wanted it and then Jacob had to go away for for years probably decades and finally came back maybe never saw his mom again if we just wait on God's way while we're actively doing what he wants us to do you know we don't mess it got, we're not gonna mess up God's plan but we can mess things up for ourselves and and have some consequences as a result so waiting um I also have it's an interesting word that means that I bind my weaknesses to God's strength. And I love that idea that recognizing in the waiting that it's not my strength that's going to do it. But when I bind my weaknesses and count on God's strength, then that's when he's going to, I'm going to gain that new strength and I'm going to not grow weary. And I love the idea of mounting up like eagle swings because they ride on the currents and they rise on those currents and sometimes just basically are gliding. It's not even flapping. It's just being uplifted by just think about those currents going under their wings. Um, and that word gain there means to renew or to change, to substitute for something better. So it's not just have and add to it. It means to completely substitute, get rid of yourself and gain from God what you need. So I love that. But again, those are very familiar verses. And she suggested we memorize 31. It's a great one to memorize. Okay, so overall, this chapter is about that good news, that comfort for Judah and Jerusalem and that the Lord is coming and his reward is with him. And that if we wait and gain, we will gain that new strength. If we wait on the Lord. There's a lot in this chapter. It's hard to put it into just one little segment or decision. Okay. So now we're going to move on to 41. Um, and overall, this one is about 
God calling. God's calling one, it says. He's calling one from where? There's two different places it talks about God calling someone. East. One's from the east. That's in the very first paragraph. And then later in the chapter, he calls, I think the last paragraph, he calls one from the north. Um, I don't know exactly the significance of that. The east is a little significant because that's how the sun rises. That's what we know about Jesus is the bright morning star. Um, so my mind went to Jesus, but I'm not, don't, 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 I don't put that in my column yet. You know, in my, um, so just know that that was one of the things I thought of. I'm not sure the significance of calling one from the north, except, um, Assyria came from the north-ish and Babylon came down also through the north. So maybe that's that's talking about. But when we looked at the first two paragraphs, both of them start talking about the coastlands. Um, as you did your study this week, what do you think these the calling of these coastlands or the talking to these coastlands, who do you think he's talking about or two? Calling on the people to gain strength. Um, I think I heard what you said. Um, you're saying calling on them for for strength. Is that what you said? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, when he says coastlands, listen to me in silence. And then in verse five, he says the coastlands have seen and are afraid. The ends of the earth tremble. They've drawn near and have come. Um, I think this reference to coastlands is basically talking about like the ends of the earth. Like it might be the coastlands in the sense of if you just look at Israel and you've got the Mediterranean Sea and then a little bit over from it, you've got the Arabian Sea or whatever. It could be kind of talking about that. But I believe when you, especially in verse five, when it says the ends of the earth tremble, I think it's basically saying, you know, always God's reference is Israel. So any direction is based on Israel, not America. Um, but if it's saying from there and to go to the ends of the earth, that's including everyone. So who does that include? America. Mm -hmm. They're not named, but if he's talking about the ends of the earth, he, that would include America. That would include all peoples. Okay. So then it says in the verse, first paragraph is the first four. It says, coastlands, listen to me in silence and let the people gain new strength. Let them come forward. Let them let them speak. Let us come together for judgment. Who has aroused one from the east whom he calls? So this would be the Lord calling whom he calls in righteousness to his feet. He delivers up nations before him and subdues kings. That's what reference, who do you think he's talking about when he's calling forth someone in righteousness to his own feet, to the Jesus, to the Lord's, I'm sorry, to the Lord's feet? Um, who do you think that might be? And have you ever heard a reference to nations being brought before him? Not here necessarily, but in other, other scriptures. He delivers up nations before him and seduces kings. He makes them like dust with, a, with his sword and as the wind-driven chaff from his bow. So we get this reference again of just blowing, you know, from his mouth and things withering and being scattered and, and blown away. Um, he pursues them, passing on in safety by a way he has not been traversing with his feet who has performed and accomplished it, calling forth a generation from the beginning. I the Lord and the first and the last, I am he. Now we didn't do a cross-reference this week, but if you want to go to Revelation chapter one, Jesus says, I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. Jesus is at the beginning with God because he is God. He's at the end because he's the one that's coming forth and bringing about everything that he's going to present to the father at some point. And God has said, I subdue everyone under your feet. So who do you think this is referring to? Not the coastlands part, but the one he's calling in righteousness. I believe it's talking about Jesus. I believe this is a future to Isaiah and future to us reference to the 
final judgments that are going to come for all the people of all the world when they're brought to the valley of judgment because they're going to come against him okay then it says in five through 16 it's a long paragraph the coastlands have seen and are afraid the ends of the earth tremble they have drawn near and have come each one helps his neighbor and says to his brother be strong so the craftsman encourages the smelter and he who smooths metal with a hammer encourages him who beats the anvil saying to the soldering it is good and he fastens it with nails that it should not totter so what is the it what is not going to totter what are they fastening what are they crafting and smelting and smoothing with a hammer or beating with an anvil and soldering idols idols right if you look back to verse 20 of chapter 40 you see a very similar statement where it says to prepare an idol that will not totter here you have it again that it it i believe an idol should not totter so what the coastlands what the peoples are doing and encouraging each other is still idolatry and it says but you in contrast but you israel my servant jacob whom i have chosen descendant of abraham my friend so abraham's the friend just so you know that <laughs> um he's the one that god called his friend um it's a covenant term. You whom I've taken from the ends of the earth and called from its remotest parts and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not rejected you. Do not fear for I am with you. Okay. So when has God called Israel and Jacob from the remotest parts of the earth? In Isaiah's time? Prior to Isaiah's time? after Isaiah's time, when has this happened? I mean, it might be partial, maybe not complete, but when has this happened? If it's happened. It would not have happened in Isaiah's time because Israel was, well, they were taken out of Egypt. So you could, you could say that they did the exodus from Egypt. Um, and so there's that definitely. But as far as calling them as a people, they originated with Abraham, as it just says right there, and then came through Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob, and then the 12 tribes. And then they were in the land until these captivities which one has already happened. The Assyrian captivity has happened. They haven't been called back from it yet. And then the Babylonian captivity is coming. They will be allowed to come back from it, but only a portion come back. And then think about in not our day necessarily, but in the last hundred years, we know of the, the, Israel. yes, the German, you know, the, 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 uh, taking of the people hostage and captive and God establishing the nation of Israel in what is it 48 um, and where are they oh. being called from where have the Jews been scattered to everywhere everywhere absolutely and they still are they're they're here in America they're every well I guess they're about everywhere I can't swear they're everywhere but I guess they're about everywhere in the world so when there is this calling forth of them or this drawing of them it has begun, but it's not completed. So this is not fulfilled yet. Not completely. <clears throat> but will it? Is. Yes, it's after Isaiah for sure. It's even after us in the sense of it, it's ongoing, but not completely fulfilled. It's, a, it's something that's happening. But he says to them, you're my servant. I've chosen you and not rejected you. Did it, would it feel like rejection to them? over some of these events that we we know are coming, that we know about, that we know about from like, I, I, I was born in the 60s, so I wasn't born during Hitler's era, but I know about it, wasn't that long before me. And there may still be, I think there are still Holocaust survivors alive, but they'd be getting old, very. Um, but they, you know, maybe some of the younger ones. Um, 
And then it says in verse going on, it says, don't do not anxiously, anxiously look about you for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Okay, so if, if God's got you by his righteous right hand, those of you who did Hebrews with me, remember <laughs> when he takes hold of you, we need to be holding back. You know, yeah, I would always say this, um, but he's not going to let go. Even if I do, he's not going to let go. So being upheld with his righteous right hand is about as secure as anything you'll ever, ever imagine. Um, it is uh, it is the security. It says, behold, all of those who are angered at you will be ashamed and dishonored. Those who contend with you will be as nothing and will perish. You will seek those who quarrel with you, but will not find them. Those who war with you will be as nothing and non-existent. I mean, this is as clear as it can get. Going back to the Abrahamic covenant, he said, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. This is the fulfillment. This is the explanation and, and fleshing out of the Abrahamic covenant. You go against Israel and God's going to go against you. So take warning. For I am the Lord, your God, who upholds your right hand, who says to you, do not fear. I will help you. How many times do we see do not fear? This is so critical. Do not fear. Do not fear. I will uphold you with my right hand. Do not fear, you worm, Jacob, men of Israel. Don't you love that? <laughs> you worm, Jacob, you men of Israel. I don't know that I would say that God is calling him a worm. I would think it's more of a reference to how he's viewed. Like, what does the world maybe view Jacob as? Like a worm to be squished under their feet. I will help you, declares the Lord, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Again, if you wonder whether Jesus is God, here we know Jesus is Redeemer. I mean, that's that we know that. Now he's being called equal Redeemer, Holy One of Israel. Who's the Holy One of Israel? The Lord God, the Triune God, right? Um, but we looked up this word, redeem or redeemer this week. What did you find? I love word studies. It's, in, it's on chapter, page 10 if you want to know. If you've ever done the Kinsman Redeemer study, this should have rung some bells for you. Um, it's the word gayal. And it means to redeem or to ransom, release, deliver, to fulfill the duties of relationship. And remember the duties of the kinsman redeemer relationship was, for instance, if a brother died a childless, you the brother, the next brother was supposed to marry the, the widow in order to raise up children to have the brother's name, the dead brother's name. Um, and that was part of the story of Ruth also because Boaz came along and he was not the first of the kinsman redeemer in her life. And that guy wanted the land, but not Ruth, but Boaz wanted both or was, allow was allowing for both. He wanted the land to redeem and he wanted Ruth to raise up children to replace her husband's name. And, and that, that son, Boaz, was the father of Jesse, the father of David. So very cool story, amazing story, but we see in it that picture of kinsman redeemer, but there's also a portion of the kinsman redeemer that is the avenger, the kinsman, the, the uh, blood avenger. So if there is a murder, the blood avenger is not guilty of going after the murderer and putting the murderer to death. And there's provisions in that, you know, there's, there's a trial and everything else, not just slasher stuff. Um, but the idea of redeeming is repurchasing. You know, we, if you have a coupon and you take it to a store, you redeem the points of that coupon or the value of that coupon towards a purchase, or maybe for the whole thing, like maybe you have, um, a coupon for buy one, get one free or something. Um, so the one you got free is the redeemed one the repurchased one. So this repurchasing idea is purchasing in the, them out of the slavery of sin. Was Israel, all of Israel, but the Northern Kingdom, Southern Kingdom, Jacob, Israel, whoever, whichever way you want to look at it, 
Were they in need of this? Yes. Are we in need of this? Mm -hmm. Yes. We all need that. Well, at hopefully you're already redeemed, but at one point in time, you were redeemed or bought back from sl the slavery of sin. It says, behold, I have made you a new threshing sledge with double edges. You will thresh the mountains and pulverize them and make the hills like chaff. You will winnow them and the wind will carry them away and the storm will scatter them. Just keep getting this image of just blowing and, and things just, evac you know, just being faded away. But, but you will rejoice in the Lord. You will glory in the Holy One of Israel. How many times have we seen Holy One? This is a very key phrase. It keeps... Um, reference to God in Isaiah. And here we see it again. So this segment, this paragraph is talking about the chosen Israel being strong, not fearing, seeing themselves as God's servant and knowing he's going to uphold them. So we've got the coastlands, the ends of the earth, possibly being, I mean, if we believe it's that, having this one from the east being called and the nations are going to be um, delivered up to him. And now we see the that God is going to uphold Israel. So in the, even in the first paragraph, even in the nations being presented before this one from the east by God looks like that's judgment for sure. Israel is going to be upheld. Israel is going to be kept. So you've got this nations and then you've got Israel over here. And then verses 17 to 20. Overall, what is this segment about, this section about? There's a lot of I wills from God in it. God will provide. Yes. Um, he, first, he tells their condition right? Their condition is afflicted and needy and seeking water. So thirsty, because then it says their tongue is parched with thirst, but it says, I, the Lord will, there's a lot of I wills. And you know, I like to mark those like with that up. Uh, yeah. The raised hand, I will answer them myself as the God of Israel. I will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and springs in the midst of valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land fountains of water. I will put a cedar in the wilderness, acacia and the myrtle and the olive tree. I will place the Jupiter, sorry, juniper in the desert together with the box tree and the cypress. Okay. All of that is provision showing the water provision for slaking the thirst. But when you start planting those trees, and having them grow up, there has to be that provision, obviously, of water in the desert. For these trees to grow, there's got to be a change. God is changing everything. Topography is changing at this point. And it says that they may see and, and recognize and consider and gain insight as well that the hand of the Lord has done this and the Holy One of Israel has created it. Okay, so let me ask you, because this is an application. When we were asked this somewhat, I think, well, I think it was pointing to this. What do you take from this? Like, who is the they? Who is the they that's going to see and recognize? Israel. I think so. But could it be the nations as well? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's happening to Israel. This is definitely happening to Israel. And, and obviously we want them to see and recognize, right? And gain insight. But maybe the nations are going to see this and go, oh, the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. So this could be all the coastlands, you know, all the ends of the earth are going to, to recognize and see. Okay, taking it a, another. What do you get from this? How can this help you? This, this is faith that we know that he's going to protect us all this time through everything. God will provide and that in that we can know and others can know too. Yes. And we need to give him glory in that, right? The, we recognize it's the Holy One of Israel and we let others ones know it's the Holy One of Israel. But 
it's such a, it is a wonderful statement of this whole paragraph. So a wonderful statement of provision, but it also just recognizes, I mean, sometimes we use these words for God creator, but do we ever really stop and think he brought it all into existence? Therefore it's not out of his control. You know, we, we have a tendency to fret and fuss about like, I'm always looking at the weather in the summer, whether or not I'm going to get to swim or whether or not we're going to get to go to the lake. And then we get mad if it doesn't fit our plans instead of realizing God's in control of all of that. And guess what? I haven't had to do. I haven't had to water anything this summer. <laughs> we had so much wonderful rain, um, but he's going to, when you look at Israel right now, you don't think water and, and cedar trees and, um, myrtle and junipers and box trees and cypresses in the middle of the desert this is the idea of the desert blooming and god bringing it back to lushness and that provision is there and in all of this there's a, I think going to be a contrast because we keep seeing this withering and fading and chaff and scattering when it's talking about the judgment that's going to happen against peoples and the nations you see this contrast over and over again but it just, it really hit me this week as I was play, putting this going, I need to see and recognize and consider and gain insight when, when I'm in my desert places, when life is not going great for me. And remember, that doesn't mean it's all just going to go away because I want it to. He might take me through that for a time, for a reason, but I can't lose sight of his provision He's in control. There's a plan and I need to be giving glory to him. Okay. Verses 21 to 24. It says, present your case. The Lord says, bring forward your strong arguments. The King of Jacob says, let them bring forth and declare to us what's going to take place. As for the former, okay. As for the former events, declare what they were, that they may consider them and know their outcome and announce to us what is coming. I just, heavy sarcasm, sorry. I'm reading it as heavy sarcasm because I feel like there's heavy, heavy sarcasm. Mm -hmm. Declare the things that are going to come afterward that we may know that you are gods. Little G. Indeed, do good or evil that we may anxiously look about us and fear together. Behold, you are of no account and your work amounts to nothing. He who chooses you is an abomination. Okay, so this was one that I had to read over and over. Who do you think that they are? Who do you think the, the who chooses you? Like, who is it talking about here? Well, definitely, I think he's behind it. Um, he definitely would be on the side of this, you know, whether it's he himself that God is talking to. Um, it's possible that he's talking about people that, you know, unbelievers, obviously. It's talking about at the end when he says he who chooses you is an abomination makes me think choosing an, an idol, you know, and a false religion, idolatry. But yeah. um are those idols declaring what's going to take place? Are those idols telling us what's going to happen? Are those idols, like, are they truly gods? And we know they're not. We know they're not. They're other gods and idols, and they can't do what God can. God can do. So here we have that contrast over and over again, right? So I, I believe that's what it's talking about. I think it's people making these idols and i think obviously it's saying the people that are choosing if the you is an idol um those gods are not i mean there's there's kind of like two ways of looking at it paul says there's nothing behind it <coughs> but then paul also says there's like demons or satan behind those idols like we're not to take part we're not to just dismiss them, but over and over through scripture, Psalms talks about it over and over. They keep making these idols. And it's really crazy when you think about it. They take a block of wood, they split it in half, they burn part of it to cook their meal. And then they make the other part into some statue and worship it. It's really ridiculous, but they were doing that. And then it's easy for us to go, we don't have any of those in our house. I'm not bowing down. I don't have an altar in my home. 
But the question is, what is in your life, if there is anything, what is in your life that you're putting in the place of God? Is it confession we, time? What's that? Is it, is it confession time? Well, it can be. It can be. I mean, I certainly, um, when I, when I, my first reaction is, I don't have any of that. And then. Self. Absolutely. Yeah. Putting yourself, it can be. It can be self. That's one of the worst ones here in America right now, but also your children. We can put those in there. And that was the one that hit me between the eyes early on in my Christian walk where I was, th they, they were saying, if you put your children between you and God, he will take them out of your way because he wants that connection with you. So don't put them there. <laughs> you know, don't, don't put anything there. Um, but there's also needs to be that open hand where we say, you know, whatever I have, Lord, I don't want to hold on to, you know, but this week I actually thought of like, I've got so many fractured relationships. And a lot of times I spend a lot of time thinking about that. Am I putting that focus, that attention between me and God, you know, and I, and I had to really think about that. Um, Cause we want to fix it. You know, we want to know the future. We are going to figure it out. We're going to do, you know, but, but that's what God's asking. Mm -hmm. And and it's also, we, we do want to figure it out. We do want, and he wants us to take it to him. He doesn't want us. Okay. You're frozen. Maybe I'm frozen. I hope I'm not frozen. Um, we wanted to take it to him. We just don't need to focus everything on it. Like, so whenever I find myself, and I, do, I literally do this sometimes, when I feel like I'm grasping onto something, I will pry my fingers open and say a prayer and hand it back. Okay, my, my internet connection is unstable, it's saying, sorry. Um, but pry, it, uh, pry those hands open and hand it back to him. Because um, we do feel like, I mean, we do find ourselves holding onto something again, whether it's the control issue or the wanting to do something or the telling God how it should work out. I, as I call it, define my blessing. You know, I'm going to feel like you're working this out, God, if it works out this way, you know, and, and we just, we have to, I have to give those things up over and over again. So consider that an abomination or I would be the abomination, I guess, is the verse there if I'm choosing those things over God. And then in the last paragraph here, it says, I have aroused one from the north and he has come. From the rising of the sun, he will call on my name and he will come upon rulers as upon mortar, even as the potter treads clay. Who has declared this from the beginning that we might know or from former times that we might say he is right? Um, Surely there is no one who has declared, there's no one who has proclaimed, there is no one who has heard your words. Formerly, I said to you, behold, here they are, and to Jerusalem, I will give a messenger of good news. But when I look, there is no one, and there's no counselor among them, who, if I ask, can give an answer. Behold, all of them are false, their works are worthless, their molten images are wind and emptiness." So whoever this point is coming from the north, it, it could be the Babylonians coming, maybe. Um, but whoever this is, maybe it's a still future to us event that somebody's coming from the north. Um, and and it, but it, it's he's he's coming on the behest of God. God is he's going to be calling on God's name. Does that mean that he's Jesus? Does that mean he's? I, I don't. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that. In all of these, like the Assyrian captivity, the Babylonian captivity, God brought all that about. He is their worker in that moment, not a necessarily a worker of good, but he's their worker in a moment. And then, it, but it's saying here, who could predict this? I mean, Isaiah is telling them this is coming, but it was never foreseen that they were going to be taken into captivity by Babylon. But if, if that's what the, this next one coming or whatever is coming but it says also again jerusalem should be the messenger of good news um instead there's no one that god is looking and there's no one that's counseling them it's false counsel all the time obviously isaiah is speaking but many of these prophets were speaking in a vacuum you know they were the only ones so that is part of what I think it's saying here, possibly, you know, there, there could be 
so many other nuances to this, but as always, whenever we're studying these passages, try to consider if we can figure it out, has this happened to, before our time between us and Isaiah? Is this happening in Isaiah's time? Is this some future to us? There's so much that is still future to us that I believe is just in here, you know, like between verses sometimes. So you go from Jesus's first coming to Jesus's second coming in the turn of a phrase. Um, so we can't always know, but if it hasn't completely been fulfilled yet, then it's still future and it will happen. Absolutely. So take heart. We've gone over our time as usual. I'm sorry, but I will take a break. But before I take a break, um, I, and we'll come back and watch the video for those who can stay. Um, was there like any other um, application that you got from this or a question you might want to ask? Um, you know, just always don't just take this as I'm, I'm writing, fill in the blanks, you know, the blank spaces, not fill in the blanks, but looking things up and moving on. Was there something that um, really struck you this week? Take heart in knowing that we can read this and it can apply to us, even though this is specifically written to Israel, <clears throat> there is that indirect application sometimes to us. Everything that was written was written for our edification, for our understanding and to keep us um, informed and knowing what's coming ahead. As Sandy and I were talking before others got on, this is so relevant to today. I mean, it feels so parallel and mirroring some of the events that were happening. Um, <clears throat> I don't know that America is going to be taken captive in the sense that we're literally going to be displaced from our houses and taken to another country, but I uh, don't see good tidings ahead. Um, we're headed down a bad path, but but God's in control and, and we can count on him. Whatever we face, we can count on knowing we are his and he will never forsake us and he will uphold us with his right hand. And that's a very mighty right hand. Um, and that Jesus is coming and his, his reward is with him. And so we need to be looking up and looking up to the skies, ready to fly, uh, ready for that fulfillment. So do your work for next week. We will meet next week, Lord willing, um, and discuss lesson two. For those who can stay, we'll watch Kay's video. We'll take about a five minute break and come back and I'll put that on. Um, and anyway, we'll end in prayer. Heavenly Father, this has been a great start to the second part. Um, it's great to start with some hope. Great to start with these really solid truths about you, the reminders, not just set in the context of the history of Israel or the future for Israel, but set so firmly and, and in our lives as well, no matter what we're facing. We can hang on to these. We can rise up on those eagle's wings. We can gain that strength as well as we remember that we are to wait on you, that we are to be waiting on you in the sense of serving you. And we should be waiting on you and not getting ahead of you as well and binding our weakness to your strength, understanding that we're weak and need your strength and getting out of our own way and, and just letting you be you, acknowledging you, and giving you the glory to everyone around us and sharing this good news that has been given to us as well. We thank you for that, Father. I ask you to show us those opportunities and strengthen us in the tasks that we have ahead and whatever we are to face. We thank you for it all and ask for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You're welcome.